Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Lawrence. I'm the co-founder and CEO of ChainGuard. Today, we're going to be talking about a really important problem and one that's core to ChainGuard's mission, uh, trust in open source. We're going to be talking about how trust has traditionally been built up in open source, what trust means, and then some of the ways that trust in open source is under attack today. This is a slightly longer version of a talk that I gave earlier last month in October. Um, at the Kubernetes Community Days event in London. I gave that talk as a keynote and it was about 20 minutes, but I had so much more material to cover and there's even so much more that I can cover today. So we're gonna do a slightly extended version of this talk today uh, to cover these problems in a little bit more depth. Um, but first, it's also important uh, to get this special announcement in place. Um, this is airing in the beginning of November, uh, right after we at ChainGuard announced our Series B funding. Um, we just raised a round of funding from led by Spark Capital, as well as some of our existing investors, to help solve this problem in a bit more depth. We've been working in this space for a while. Trust is really important to the overall software supply chain industry, and it's important that we get this right. Uh, because of all the work that we've done here, we've been able to amass a huge set of customers um, and grow as a business, both uh, in our commercial product side, but as well as in open source. So a lot of the problems that I'm going to be talking about later today are related to this uh, area that we're in. All right, let's jump in. Um, let's start with this quote. I really think this quote is important to help frame this space. It says, you may be deceived if you trust too much, but you will live in torment if you don't trust enough. I don't think this quote was originally written about open source software, but it's hard not to see it that way after working in this space for a few years. This is the dichotomy that we all face, whether to trust each other and risk a breach, an incident, your infrastructure getting compromised, or not to trust all of the open source out there in the world and be able to and not be able to develop software. That's what this talk is about, that trust and how open source and through open source, the entire software industry is built on that trust. We're gonna talk about how open source enables the entire industry and has earned that trust throughout the past few decades, uh, but some of the problems that it's faced with today, and we need to act now to preserve that trust and to preserve the ability to keep using open source the way that we have been up until today. We're all taking code written by other people. We're standing on the shoulders of these giants by building, modifying, consuming, and publishing our own versions of all of that code. We're implicitly trusting every author, every maintainer, and every project that's come before us. Every library that's been published on NPM, every source code package uploaded to GitHub, all of this that's come before us, everything that we depend on before we start writing our code, we trust that to be written correctly. We trust that to be written securely. We trust the authors to not be malicious. And that's where the friction is starting to come in. As the DevOps movement starts to translate into DevSecOps, as cybersecurity practitioners start to operate in a zero trust environment, um, open source is the opposite of zero trust. Open source in many ways is maximum trust. And I mean that in a good way, but that gap is creating a lot of friction especially as attackers start to focus their attention on open source software and cybersecurity organizations are forced to apply closer scrutiny to the open source software we've been building on for years. All of this coming together has put us at a crossroads in open source. New regulations are coming in both the United States and Europe aiming to rein in its usage in the name of increased cybersecurity. Maintainers of projects are burning out. These regulations are asking them to shoulder more of that burden. And I think that's a recipe for disaster. Open source itself is resilient. I wanna be clear there. It will do what it always does. Open source is gonna find a way to persevere. The bigger question though, is how organizations continue to operate. And it's not gonna be exactly the same as it is today unless we make some major changes. So let's start with the agenda here. This talk is gonna cover a bit of the history of trust in open source because it's hard to talk about solutions without talking about how we got here, as well as some recent innovations. I'll start out by explaining a bit more what I mean by trust how it's worked in other open source projects and other open source ecosystems. Um, and then I'm gonna focus a bit on the cloud native space because that's where a lot of us operate in today. The Kubernetes, YAML, Docker, OCI world. Right after I get through that, I always have to take this quick break. Uh, we have to put open source security into context. Um, as we talk about improving open source, it's really, really important to frame and remind everyone how great the state of security and open source really is compared to all of the other alternatives. We can still speak constructively about how to improve it without maligning it and without pretending that there's some world we can return to without open source. And I do truly believe that we can harden our software supply chains. 
Those are the technology that we use to build and distribute open source while still preserving what makes open source great, the community aspect. If we get this right, then enterprises will be able to continue to build on and contribute back to and embrace open source. Governments can focus on helping rather than hurting open source adoption. There's so many benefits to it. Um, and we can get back to doing what we as engineers and builders and makers do best, shipping cool shit for our users and customers and communities. So let's jump in. I'll start here by explaining what I mean by trust in open source. Um, and here's that fun iceberg slide. Uh, trust is what enables all this innovation we built today, right? We framed that. Trust is a beautiful thing. We're building software on top of tons and tons and tons of other software written by others and distributed freely on the internet. By every metric I've seen, every study, 90 to 98% of all modern software is open source. That's huge. That's the part of the iceberg under the water. When you first start building your software, that's just the tip of the iceberg above the surface. You're building it on millions and millions and millions of lines of free software contributed to the digital public good for free by other people that came before us. That's all possible because of the trust that we're placing in them, but we can't take that trust for granted. This software is freely distributed on the internet and anyone on the internet can publish it. Anyone that's spent any time on the internet probably knows and is terrified by that to some extent. Not everyone on the internet is a nice person. Not everyone on the internet is trustworthy. We've gotten here today though, because I believe, and I think it's true, um, a fundamental principle that most people are good, even though some aren't. By believing in that premise that most people are, are good and they have good intentions, uh, by relying on that, we've been able to build this beautiful open source ecosystem. All the GitHub stars, all the package downloads, all the container uploads um, that we're all here and we're all a part of today. We can't take that for granted. Um, that trust is being undermined and attacked from a bunch of different angles culminating at once today. What we're starting to see, uh, really troubling, is that attackers are realizing all of this implicit trust exists. They're starting to realize how much blind trust has been placed into open source, and they're starting to take advantage of it. They're starting to attack that trust by publishing malware, and attack that trust by taking over projects, and hostile uh, code commits. They're attacking it from a bunch of different ways here. Um, and that means open source and our ability to keep using it are under attack uh, that same way. And again, I'm not worried about open source really here as a whole. Open source is anti-fragile. Open source is going to be fine. Open source has been fine forever. Um, open source routes around damage. I really like this quote. The trust that's under attack, um, that's really going to harm the way companies can use open source. Open source is going to be fine. It survived decades of FUD campaigns from some of the largest security vendors and largest software vendors in the world, and you can't trust open source. And it's been through that fine, and it's thriving. It's the healthiest it's ever been. Um, so not all of the problems we're facing today are new, uh, but some of them are, and they're coming at us uh, from different angles, different shapes, and different sizes. Um, we have nation-state attackers now looking to take advantage of open source to attack other companies in other countries. We have large companies relicensing software, pretending it's uh, under the guise of sustainability, and really it's just increased profits. We have misinformed regulators, even internet trolls uh, pushing malware into projects just to get people to laugh on social media. This isn't new though, and a lot of these problems have been solved before. It's hard to talk about open source and distribution and trust without taking inspiration from the space of Linux distributions, really the first ones that started solving this problem. So let's take a look at how they work next. A lot of these take inspiration here from this early paper, right? This isn't a new problem. And Linux distros have lived a lot of these challenges uh, today. Um, so I've got to throw this quick meme in. Um, you can't really talk about the space without mentioning Ken Thompson's famous paper called Reflections on Trust and Trust. Um, it has the word trust in it twice, so it's got to be relevant to this topic. Um, but really it is, right? It, it kind of frames this problem space back in 1984. Um, so if you haven't heard of this by now, I would definitely recommend reading the paper. It's pretty short. If you have heard of it, well, you get to hear about it one more time today. What this paper showed, um, and Russ Cox has actually published some really awesome blog posts recently digesting it and publishing uh, some samples and real details and historical context about what happened. What this paper showed, though, is through some amazing pranks that Ken Thompson played on his coworkers inside of Bell Labs, said if you didn't build every piece of software from the history of time, kind of the start of computing yourself from scratch in like a hermetically sealed environment, then you can't trust much that we've built our modern computing frameworks on. A backdoor hidden in any one of those components, that your compiler, low-level things like your linkers, your build tools, your scripts on your workstation, 
Uh, a backdoor in any one of those components can result in a full compromise of your application. It's almost undetectable. Ken took it a little bit further where he inserted a backdoor into a compiler. It would print out the user's password when any binary that was uh, run through that compiler was run. Um, the smart people at Bell Labs, of course, know how to disassemble binaries and find malware and code like this, but Ken took it one step further where he inserted a backdoor into the disassembler too. And so if you disassembled one of these compromised binaries, the disassembler hid the backdoor. So people were reading this assembly code bite for bite and still couldn't figure out what was happening. That's the level of undetectability that you can build up with uh, a backdoor like this. But it's much later than 1984 now. It's been a few decades. Um, and we're all still using computers. We're all not compiling everything from the history of the universe ourselves. And the world hasn't self-destructed. So what does that mean? Did Ken Thompson figure out a way to solve this? The answer is no, not really. There's been a bunch of hand-waving around reproducible build environments, and a lot of Linux distributions are working on that, and they do solve real problems. Um, Dr. David A. Wheeler also publishes PhD thesis on something called diverse double compilation, which is a way to detect backdoors and compilers. But for the most part, no one bothers with any of this stuff. We're not doing this day to day. If we can't trust any modern computing, then how do we get anything done? That's where trust comes back in. We trust each other. It's the same way we build societies and our overall global ecosystem works. And we trust each other. The only thing we have in open source and the only thing we have um, in computing is our reputations. It's almost the same way all software works. The trust came from people. We can't prove that there's no backdoor, but if we trust the people that compiled it and we trust that they tried their best, uh, then that, that's not nothing. That is worth something. That's what that trust was based on in the earliest days of software, in particular, the earliest days of Linux. All software that was transmitted was distributed in source code format. This was published. Um, you could buy magazines that had source code that you could type in on your own computer. Um, certain cryptography algorithms were printed on t-shirts. Um, that's how early source code and early open source was distributed. This is done for a bunch of reasons, not just for trust. Uh, people ran on lots of different architectures. Uh, Cross-compilation and supporting different CPU types was really hard. Distributing the source code and letting people build it for their own machines was easier. Shipping source code was also smaller than shipping binaries. Good luck typing the assembly code in from a magazine. Um, so there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, but one of the side benefits is that it doesn't require a ton of trust to be placed in the upstream projects and the maintainers. If you're typing in the source code line by line, you're reviewing it. You could see exactly what was in there, and you could change it yourself. That was a good thing. That was pivotal to the success of Linux. You had all of the source code for every program on their workstation living next to it on that workstation. You could recompile it with, easily with changes. It's, harder to, it's hard to do that even today, though, even with modern usable compilers, errors, advancements in linters and tooling. Um, so even though it was relatively easy to do back in the day, um, it's only really something for computer experts, and that hasn't really changed over time. The average user of a computer isn't ready and doesn't want to compile stuff uh, from source themselves. And that's what helped grow Linux, and that's what helped grow the open source space. Eventually, Linux distributions started to appear. They handled that compilation, the testing, making sure all the different versions were ABI compatible, um, and all the programs worked not just alone, but together. This is general curation for users. So not every user needed to know how to compile an entire Linux distribution from scratch to be able to, to run Linux on a computer. If you do feel like doing this, you can look up Linux from scratch. It's a great book that helps you walk through how to compile and how to bootstrap compilers and how to get yourself up and running from nothing. Uh, but that's not something everyone should have to do day to day. And this really unlocked the adoption of Linux early on. Um, these first binary distributions, uh, things like Slackware and Debian, um, they've gone on today to spawn most of modern Linux distros. And they've improved usability a ton by providing pre-built packages and sets of packages tens of thousands long. They were tested against each other and were known to be stable. You could get a fixed distribution that somebody had proven worked, uh, and you didn't have to spend all that time debugging just to get up and running. This was a huge shift. Part of the shift, though, in addition to relying upstream, on upstream projects to ship working code successfully, you also had to trust the distribution maintainers to compile it correctly. Because if you think back to that reflections on trust and trust piece, malware inserted here would be much harder to detect than malware inserted directly into the source code. By getting binaries from a Linux distribution, now you're trusting the upstream maintainer who writes the source code and the distribution, that right? you're trusting two different sets of people. So that's a huge shift that happened at the same time in the name of improving usability. 
this choice wasn't really uh, an obvious one. These people didn't really have much else. This was really their only choice. So they used these distributions. And over time, the distributions built up trust. Debian has been around for over 30 years now, and they've done a huge amount of work, both in the supply chain and security space, but also in general security, to earn that trust. They recognize the amount of trust that users were placing in them, the amount of faith that people had that they were going to do everything correctly, and they did everything they could to protect it. No one's perfect, but they've really advanced the state of the art in software security over the past few decades by pioneering a lot of the efforts to help build up trust in the software supply chain. They rolled out a cryptographic signing mechanism for packages back in 2003. Um, and they continue to do work on reproducible builds and bootstrapping everything from source to defend against those other types of attacks. They do a very good job at this, much better than most enterprise companies. And they do all of this for free. So how can a community project like this do something for free? Well, the answer is they do it very carefully. They're a distributed project with maintainers and contributors from all over the world in tons of different countries. They have distributed governance for all of this. But what they do is they have a very strict membership policy for becoming a package maintainer. Before you can actually build, do builds and uploads for Debian packages, you have to build trust up with the existing maintainers over a long period of time and show that you're trustworthy. Up until very recently, this trust building process also involved a quorum of the existing package maintainers actually meeting you in person, checking your government ID to see that you are who you say you are, and signing off on your uh, cryptographic signing keys. It sounds overboard and way overkill for a lot of projects today. But when you look at exactly how widely deployed Debian and its packages are, today you realize how juicy of a target this would be for attackers. Debian has earned the trust of the community, and they require new maintainers to earn the trust of their existing maintainers over time before handing them the keys to the kingdom. It's not just Debian that's done this, although they were one of the earliest. That trust model uh, of codifying that trust uh, is typically done with a cryptographic technique called digital signatures. Debian uses the PGP key signing system, which supports this kind of web of trust model, where if enough existing maintainers sign the keys of new maintainers at these in-person events, um, then they get added to the Debian key ring. Um, these signatures get checked as new packages are uploaded. Uh, and then the Debian distribution uh, as itself kind of re-signs uh, all the packages that have been uploaded. Uh, so when they're published from Debian, users can check those signatures no matter where they find those packages and ensure that the packages that they're installing came from the Debian distribution and the maintainers uh, that they do trust and that hasn't been tampered with along the way. This is really imp important early on for Linux distributions because of the way packages were distributed. You didn't just go to debian.org over an HTTPS TLS connection and download directly from there. TLS didn't even exist back at this point. Um, Debian was mirroring these packages because they were huge over tons and tons of different FTP servers or other file download mechanisms. So just because you were downloading packages, they called themselves Debian packages, you had no real way of proving that it came from Debian until this secure package distribution system was built. And most other Linux distributions have rolled out similar techniques. They all work a little bit differently, but they all basically guarantee that you can get the packages from the distro. The whole set of these mirrors will be sure that they haven't been tampered with along the way. Red Hat has a full a fully built package signing system on their own for their Linux distribution. Ubuntu has the exact same one as Debian with a few tweaks on how you get added to the key ring because they're a commercial company. Arch Linux has their own large security team and their own custom signing format. Same for Alpine Linux. All these different package managers um, work a little bit differently, but the security guarantees are roughly the same. The distribution maintainers are vouching for the security in the software that they ship. In many cases, they're actually even forking that software to modify it along the way. Um, these modifications could be to improve performance or fix security issues or changing it in other ways to make it better fit with their other package set before they ship it to users. So you're really centralizing that trust on the distribution, both for correctness, but also for general security. Uh, but this does make them a large uh, point of failure, a central point of trust. So they take great care to ensure security of the entire process. And they've built that trust up over time. So that's part of their brand. When you get something from one of these well-known, long-lived Linux distributions, you know where you're getting it from and you know that you can trust them. This all works great, but unfortunately, that's not the only way open source gets used or consumed. And that's that trust gap that I talked about before. There's kind of this parallel universe in some ways of open source uh, distribution models that have popped up a little bit later um, or, or around kind of the same time, depending on how you look at it. Um, this other universe is the decentralized or federated or kind of libertarian style, anything goes world of the programming language level package managers. 
These are things like NPM, PIP, uh, Ruby Gems, Composer for PHP. Um, these all look and feel like Linux distribution package managers, but they all work a little bit differently, especially from the trust perspective. And this rise in language level package managers has created a gap. The package managers look and feel the same. Right? NPM install feels a lot like apt-get install or pip install, but they do completely different things from that trust perspective. So there's this large gap that isn't apparent when you're running install, but they require completely different trust assumptions to be placed in where you're getting these packages from. So a bit more history too, uh, and let's focus on Python's package index. So this uh, code name here is the cheese shop, uh, but it's also called PyPI or PyPy. It's pronounced a bunch of different ways, uh, but it's the Python package index. It's actually launched back in 2002. So later than Linux distros, but still around the same time that they were coming to grips with security. Um, now the name cheese shop, the kind of code name for it, um, it actually came from a Monty Python sketch where someone is trying to buy cheese from something labeled a cheese shop, but they can't get it. Uh, the vendor will not sell them cheese despite being a cheese shop. So the answer here is that Python was trying to make this cheese available. There were tons of Python packages, and um, there was just no way to get them. Um, in the first version of this, uh, developers could upload Python packages, which could then be installed by other users with something like pip install, that command. CPAN uh, for Perl dates back to some time around then. Uh, Maven Central started a little bit later than this for Java. Um, these package uh, repositories look and feel like their Linux counterparts, but they took a completely different approach to curation. Basically, they didn't do any. Anyone could upload any package. Sure, there were some licensing kind of concerns in there around uh, how they had to be licensed. Uh, but once they were uploaded, anyone could download them. Um, you're not getting the packages from Python, the Python community, or the Python maintainers. You're not even really getting them uh, from the people running the cheese shop or the package index. They're actually getting packages uploaded from some random person on the internet without any real trust or security guarantees baked in. To make it worse, these packages could depend on each other. So if you wanted to install just one package, you'd actually get the full transitive closure in the entire package set. It's a single installation could install packages from dozens of random people on the internet. If we're gonna stick with the somewhat tired by now cheese shop metaphor, Linux distros are like shops you can go into, traditional ones, ones from outside the Monty Python sketch. They might purchase cheese from farmers or other cheesemongers or somewhere else, um, but at that cheese shop, you know who you got it from. If you bought cheese and there's a bad batch, you report it back to that cheese shop. Um, they have codes and standards for the vendors they select. They do reviews. They check to make sure that the cheese is stored at the right temperature so it doesn't go bad. And if something goes wrong, you know where to leave a nasty Yelp review. They don't make all of the cheese necessarily themselves, but they package up, they price it, they sell it, they curate it, and they're responsible for it. The Python version, though, is not like that. It's not a cheese shop. It's a big empty tent full of cheese you can go grab that's laying around on tables. Some of it might have labels on it. Some might not. And some of the labels might be wrong. There might be little business cards next to them for who made it. But somebody could have just scrambled all of those up, too. When you just pick up a piece of cheese from one of these random tables and eat it, uh, you have no recourse if something bad happened because you have no idea where it came from. And they're all sitting next to each other, right? Some of these might be real certified cheeses that are great. Some of them might be uh, leftover stuff from somebody's lunch a few weeks ago, all sitting next to each other with no way to tell. I don't know too much about cheese, but some of the best ones out there are rotten. Um, it's really hard to tease this apart. In that world, you probably wouldn't keep going to that cheese shop or any grocery store that operated that way. In some ways, that's madness. But on the open source side, it's just kind of worked. Um, it's worked this way in programming language ecosystems for decades now. I don't really know how it works or why it works, but it just does. Going way back in time, I remember when I first started learning programming. I picked up Python sometime around 2006 or 2007 when I was in college. I remember struggling to install the NumPy program so I could generate some graphs. It's a quick side note. Some things never change. I still don't know how to install NumPy. <laughs> Uh, but back then, it was hard, too. Some guides you'd find on the internet said to run apt-get install numpy if you were on a Linux computer. Some said to use pip install. After enough swearing and Googling and uh, tracing around error messages, you'd probably get a working Python program. Um, and at that time, I didn't really understand the massive semantic difference in those two. These Linux distros packaged up things like Python and numpy, and so did pip. Uh, in the first case, though, when you're getting it from the Linux distribution, you know where you're getting it from. In the second case, you don't know. Those two commands look like the same thing, uh, but they're massively different. Well, unfortunately, as other programming languages popped up, they all copied these kind of first few, the PyPIs, uh, the Maven Centrals. 
um, C pants. Maven has their own take on some aspects of this, um, but it's still not perfect. All the others that popped up, like Ruby, PHP, Node.js, and .NET, um, all basically have nothing in place for this. And then finally, in the cloud native space where we're all working in today, um, Docker came out on top of that um, and caused a bunch of additional problems by packaging up all of these other formats. So Docker lives at the top here. Docker has all of these existing programs rolled up into one. Docker images are so easy to build because they use the existing package managers inside of them. You run an npm install to get npm packages and then wrap that up into a Docker image. You run an npm install, pip install, and app get install. And shift that entire thing as one big tarball. Now, this is a big problem, and Docker recognized this and actually get a, a really big shout out here because they started to recognize this trust gap early on and bridge this uh, in the early days with something called verified builds. Um, there's not much you can find out about them today, uh, but this was a feature built into Docker Hub that I think we're really far ahead of their time. Um, these Docker verified builds were a way for users to specify the build script for a Docker image um, in the form of a Docker file um, in a source code repository and have Docker do that build for you as that user. What that meant is when you found an image in a registry, if it went through the Docker verified builds program, um, it would have this cool check mark saying that Docker actually built it and could vouch for how that image was built. They provide a link back over to that Docker file, the exact Docker file that was used to build the image. Um, so this says that a maintainer wrote that Docker file, but Docker actually did that build. And so you know, assuming you trust Docker, that those are the correct steps that were executed to show you what came in that image. If there's a line to insert malware, you'd see that sitting in there. A lot of ways to hide stuff around, uh, but this was a huge first step that was made in this overall space. Um, and it works pretty well in this case, because container images uh, have a lot of awesome properties. The main one is that they're content addressable. And that means you can pull them by a digest to make sure that things don't change out from under you. The digest encapsulates the entire file system. So it's that entire package set. So you can just run the image directly and be sure nothing is going to change. So if you had one of these Docker verified builds, you could trace it back to exactly how it was built and the exact source code that was used to produce that uh, cryptographic digest. You can't do that today with Python or Ruby or PHP or Node.js. Um, the Node.js team has actually done a huge amount of work recently to start bridging this trust gap in NPM with their own verified builds program. It's awesome. Um, it's early days, but it's come a long way. And the team there at GitHub has done some amazing work to help bridge that trust gap. I do expect other programming language ecosystems to start adding features like this soon. But it's awesome to note that Docker rolled this out years ago and is continuing to improve it. So they deserve a big shout out for that. Um, today, there have been a bunch of advancements on making signing easier, things like uh, the open container initiative specification for attaching reference types, um, and SigStore to help users manage keys. Um, this all works because we're working on standard deployment targets, um, and I do expect to see it expand in the future, but a lot of the technology is still new. Um, so jumping back to Docker, um, the challenge that it has isn't really caused by Docker, it's that it sits on top of a bunch of package formats. Um, Docker is not actually the end game, though. Docker is not the final uh, boss in this cloud native ecosystem. Um, it gets worse from that. Uh, there's a layer on top of Docker that's commonly used in the Kubernetes space called Helm. And what Helm does is it lets you package up a bunch of Docker images in configuration. Um, and those Docker images package up a bunch of other packages. So it's a package of packages of packages. Um, these Helm charts can grab images from all sorts of different sources, and they can depend on other ones, too. So if you install the Helm chart for Prometheus, like I'm showing here, um, you get a bunch of other images from a bunch of random personal projects. Um, like you can see uh, this Kiwi Grid Kate's sidecar image that gets thrown in just when you're trying to install Prometheus. So you might be sure you're getting Prometheus uh, from the Prometheus maintainers. This on the Artifact Hub even shows that it comes from a verified publisher. But it depends on stuff that doesn't come from verified publishers. And it's really hard to bridge this transitive closure. So another quick aside here on an attempt to solve this problem early on, um, historically, uh, is the official Helm charts repository. You might remember this uh, if you worked in Kubernetes in the early days. There actually used to be this central repository called the Helm official charts repository. And this was maintained by the official Helm maintainers, where they curated these Helm charts uh, for very specific applications. You could go there and get high quality charts with documentation and tests and updated container images for everything from like Postgres to Grafana to MySQL uh, to Redis, all of these applications that you might be running on Kubernetes. Unfortunately, over time, the maintenance for this repository started to get hard uh, and there were too many applications added and it was too many for the original maintaining team to scale. Uh, so instead of trying to scale it, 
um, they actually went with the federated model um, that we see in programming languages, uh, where they broke down and kind of uh, deprecated that central official repository in place of every project maintaining their own charts. I really do think this is unfortunate. I think we had a chance here to build, uh, to rebuild a lot of those security guarantees you get out of Linux distros in the cloud native space with the official Helm charts repository, uh, but it went away. I think scaling was a real problem, but I do think there's a chance that the community could have rallied around that and figure out how to solve those scaling problems so that we could have a trustworthy open distribution of cloud native apps the same way Linux distros work. Uh, but unfortunately, it got deprecated, and we have to start over from a federated world now. All right, we've talked about a bunch of the problems with open source now. Um, so let's take that time for that quick pause and that quick aside, because as you talk about open source uh, security, it's easy to focus on the negatives, which can rightly trigger criticism from open source advocates, and I get that. Open source really does deserve our trust. It's not perfect, and there's a lot of work that we can do to improve it. But by every metric I've ever seen, it is far better than proprietary software from a security standpoint. Look at the worst incidents in the history of open source. Right? These are things like heart bleed. The time OpenSSL was barely maintained, and it was responsible for most of the modern cryptography on the internet. It had a bug. Oh well, all software has bugs. The software I write has bugs, the software you write has bugs, the software ChatGPT writes has bugs. Some of those bugs have a security impact. I've written code that has CDs in it. It just happens. The existence of Heartbleed and OpenSSL was not a failure in open source. It was a success story. Heartbleed was patched quickly under massive industry pressure um, and embargoes, and it was rolled out across the industry relatively quickly as well. That time to resolution, that's important. You can't prevent everything, but you can recover from it quickly. And that was a huge success case for open source, in my opinion. And we see this with other vulnerabilities too. log for shell was similar. Hog for Shell was the worst case scenario for an open source vulnerability. This was the most widely used library and the most widely used programming language on the planet. Log for J was even running on the Mars rover. Um, so this was the first intergalactic vulnerability or interplanetary uh, open source vulnerability. In this case, it was trivial to exploit in an incredibly widely used platform and it had devastating consequences. And this was free software and then no one was paying for. Um, this fix was rolled out quickly. The maintainers were around, they were able to patch it, they were able to roll it out in a matter of days. This was another success story, not a failure. Compare this disclosure and fix timeline of a couple days to that of firmware vendors or even cloud providers or other companies with embargo and disclosure programs. They take 30 to 60 to 90 days to roll out fixes for something like this in the best case if they even do it. The transparency of open source provides better, faster, and more robust security guarantees. I'll say it again, open source is here to stay. We have to improve it, but it's around. We're not going to get rid of it or replace it with something better. 90% of the known exploited vulnerabilities list, now this is a list maintained by CISA in the United States, 90% um, of the vulnerabilities that are known to be exploited in the wild are in proprietary software. Yet 90 to 98% of the software actually used in the world is open source. I think these stats should speak for themselves. They should really be reversed if open source is at the same security level as proprietary software. But uh, it's flipped because it's on a much, much, much better standpoint. So problems exist, they exist everywhere, and open source is going to route around them. And it can do that because we can discuss it uh, and provide critical feedback, propose solutions, and we can implement them. We're responsible for fixing these problems ourselves. And we don't need permission. Open source makes it so anyone can fix this. So don't take any of this criticism, any of this constructive feedback as me saying open source is insecure or bad. I'm not saying that. One more time, all these big, massive uh, horror stories that you might see covered in the news uh, poorly, um, these are success stories. All source code has bugs. Some bugs cause security issues. The proper thing here to measure is the speed of remediation. Not all these, and all these cases were handled transparently and promptly. So these are success stories, not failures. Where the failure comes in and where the challenge comes in in open source security is really around the way that companies and enterprises consume open source and manage it and deal with inventory. Open source communities patch CVEs very quickly. It's that enterprises forget to update or don't know that they need to update. 30% of the downloads of Log4j are still of old vulnerable versions. This is a problem with open source inventory management inside of companies, not open source itself. All right, so I've done a bunch of talking about problems and criticizing. 
I don't like to do that without talking about fixes, right? So this next section is about the gap that we've identified. Um, we can frame this a little bit more and then talk about how we can start to address that gap. I think it's important to first break down the problem and break it down into two areas. One part of the gap, this trust gap that we talked about, is the lack of that tamper-proof seal. You used to go buy software in a store, something like, say, CompUSA or Best Buy or one of these other places. It came shrink-wrapped, right? It came in a box that was shrink-wrapped. You purchased it, you knew exactly what you were getting. You knew it came from the person that it was supposed to. And you hadn't been tampered with along the way. Linux distros preserved that without that kind of plastic shrink wrap. They did it with cryptographic seals. You built cryptography into their trust system so that when you downloaded stuff from mirrors, you knew where you were getting it from, and attackers couldn't compromise those binaries along the way. You knew that that program came from your distro and that you trusted that distro. We've made a lot of progress in the cloud native ecosystem in this regard, but it's still a gap. Official Kubernetes releases, these are now signed using SigStore. So when you download some of those Kubernetes uh, containers that get mirrored around on the internet, you can verify that you're getting those uh, from the authentic, you can verify that they're authentic and that you're getting them from the official Kubernetes maintainers. Many of the Helm charts in Artifact Hub now also come from verified publishers. I showed that on the Artifact Hub slide. This is a great way to know that you're getting Prometheus from the official Prometheus maintainers um, or that you're getting something from the official upstream projects. You can decide who you want to trust. And this is also built on some of the same SIG store signing techniques. Digital signatures are an authentication layer for open source. That's how I think about them. Um, they allow you to be sure that something is authentic. They can't tell you that it's good or bad, but they can tell you that it's authentic. NPM, PyPI, and a bunch of other language level package managers are building signing out in the same way so that you can be sure that the artifacts you're getting are what they're supposed to be. They're not solving that curation problem. This is only half of it. Um, but that authentication layer lets you build strong trust policies that can be used to bridge the rest of that trust gap. Just because something is signed doesn't mean you can trust it. It does mean that you can verify where you, where you got it from. Now. That's the second half here, the distribution aspect or the curation aspect. You can do a quick demo here just to show how this works yourself. You can see the power, um, if you're on a computer, of what a Linux distribution or another software distribution can actually do. If you're running on a Mac, I encourage you to open up your terminal and type in OpenSSL version. It's two words. See what pops out. Right. That is the binary called OpenSSL on your Mac. And if you look into the output there, see that it's not actually OpenSSL. In the Mac distribution, these typical Unix tools, they take great care and swap things out and make sure that the software they're shipping um, is going to work well on their platform. And in this case, they've decided to use a different implementation of OpenSSL uh, called LibreSSL. It comes from a whole different project, but is uh, flag compatible. It's not just that program. Um, if you're still on a Mac and you haven't messed with your settings, you can run GCC space dash V, get the version of it, and you'll see the same thing. Uh, if you run GCC on a Mac, you don't get GCC. It is not GCC. Apple decided to drop a different compiler in there, in this case, Clang or CLang. Distributions choose the software to ship. They build it, they curate it, they test it all against each other, and then they throw that tamper-proof seal on it. Um, they can fix security issues, they can tweak compiler settings, or they can just wholesale replace implementations of these programs. Distributions are responsible for the end-to-end -end quality of the software that they ship, and that's the biggest gap in the cloud-native uh, world, the cloud native uh, version of software development, the lack of distros and the lack of curation. Now, there are a few uh, commercial Kubernetes distributions, and then of course, there's the official Kubernetes release itself, but these aren't all complete systems. You still need to stand up Helm charts and a whole bunch of other things uh, before it's a usable system. This would be like handing someone the base POSIX tools in a terminal and calling that a day. You can't run workloads off of that. You need a lot more, and that's where the distribution model has fallen apart. They don't include the Helm charts you need to stand up monitoring, debugging, continuous deployments, service meshes, uh, security alerts. Users are left cobbling all of this together on their own. Um, this is great for the massive CNCF landscape because they get so much choice, but it's hard for usability and it's a security nightmare. You can't get it all from one vendor or community. You have to trust thousands of people to get a working Kubernetes system stood up. Again, we used to have the basics of that and the start of that with the early days of the official Helm charts repository, but that's gone now. Um, maintaining these things is hard, but Linux distros are also a ton of maintenance. Debian is 30 years old now and has hundreds of contributors for thousands or tens of thousands of packages. They've been able to scale this through effort. There's no reason that we can't build something like this in a community-centric way for cloud-native. 
And that's where I'm going to leave it. One final quote to wrap up what I hope we covered a lot of today. Um, this quote, never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its eyes. Um, I think this is pretty fitting because that's what we're doing today. We're trusting software that is on the verge of being able to think for itself, but we don't know how it got there. We don't know where its eyes or its brain are. Um, there's no one size or simple answer for this. There's a bunch of incremental improvements we can make to fix supply chain and open source security. And we need to. We need to do that to preserve the trust and protect open source's reputation in the way the companies use it, by allowing that reputation to be built up over time through these trust and authentication systems. And if we do that right, we can strengthen all of our supply chains so that maintainers that are trustworthy can remain trusted and can build up and protect that trust over time. We need to know where the software we're running is coming from to enable them to build all of that up. And then on the second hand, we also need a new type of project, one that helps centralize and aggregate that trust. This exists all over open source, except in a few pockets, which happen to be where we operate today in cloud native, where we're sitting at the top of the stack. That's the perfect place to try that again. And that's what we're trying here at Chainyard with the Wolfie OS project. We're trying to build a distribution of all of the stuff that's been forgotten by the others to build a set of container images that you can trust and you can rely on. Because we're responsible for building and packaging and signing and verifying all of the source code that goes into these packages and these containers and eventually this distribution of usable cloud native components. We're sitting here at the top of the stack, so it's the perfect place to try it all again. All right, thanks for listening to this talk.